Okay, so we're going to get started with our next session. Um, the uh, obligatory but very important uh, open access file. I'm a, um, in case some of you don't know, I'm a big proponent of open access. And so um, this is something we did several years ago for the workshop. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's only been uh, beneficial for all of us. Nobody, it's, it's never been abused. Except the interesting thing, sometimes I'll go to a talk and I'll see one of my slides from somebody I have no clue who they are or who they know that I know, but they sort of went through several people and ended up in their slide deck somehow and uh, without my name, so I sort of, no, I don't say anything. But uh, it does happen, but it's, uh, it's, a, very, um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. So the other slide I have is that um, I allow, uh, um, you can do whatever you want with my talk, basically. Um, I'm, uh, I use Twitter, so I'm at BFFO on Twitter. And if you want to comment about this workshop, the tag for the workshop, if you're a Twitter user, although you should not be using Twitter during my lecture, okay, is uh, pound CBW2011. So um, this session is called Visualization. It's actually um, a poor title for it in the sense that it's really a, an excuse for us, for me, to sort of explain all the things that uh, we want to see, but also the, the data types we want to work with and what they look like. There are many, many, many ways to visualize data. We cannot uh, look at all of them. There are um, some, there's one that actually uh, John mentioned this morning, uh, Circos, which is actually becoming more and more popular, which I should have put in my lecture. I didn't. Uh, is somebody else doing it? No, but the reason we selected these is because the other subsequent people would be using these. Yes, yes. And, uh, or some of them, and some of the ones I was going to talk about, I'm actually not talking about because I knew somebody else was going to cover it. There are some um, issues with respect to uh, visualization, which uh, were a bit of a challenge for me, especially for gene expression, because uh, it was going to be hard to sort of do visualization of gene expression without, without having covered gene expression. So actually, Paul is going to cover that tomorrow, and, and I think he'll be... Uh, I will touch on it a little bit, and some of the tools I think I'm going to talk about he will be using. and so. It should all sort of work out. The, um, like I mentioned, uh, you guys are sort of the guinea pigs for this new workshop. And at the end of the workshop, we have a course evaluation. And it's a great opportunity for telling us, Francis totally messed up. He should have done his lecture on that day after that or whatever. He should have covered this and that. I, I will welcome that kind of feedback. Yes, good start. Good start. Please interrupt me before. As, uh, yes. You still? Am I, oh, you have it now. I have the rest. You have. I So actually, interesting observation here. This is uh, three screen captures from uh, the same gene, TP53, on uh, three different types of browsers. And uh, does anybody observe anything interesting? Noteworthy. Don't look at the fine print. It's fuzzy on purpose almost. No, nothing. So, so yes. So the middle one is actually is actually a both this bottom one and the top one are actually genome browsers taken from a genome browser, and this is taken from a, a gene browser, and so it's actually five prime to three prime for the gene browser, but the genome on the genome is the other way around, so it's three prime to five prime. So this is going to be a, sort of a, something to keep in mind uh, always is that. The orientation and the, some of the cues that the various uh, tools provide 
are often very similar. We'll, I'll cover some of it in the lectures, but uh, it's, it's uh, something to, to keep in mind. So I'm going to look uh, talk about what cancer data is and sort of follow up on what some of John uh, talked about. Where is this data? What you can do with it from a genomic point of view, and this is what it's going to be talked about in this module. I will not really deal with epigenomic information, although there is some at some of the sites I will talk about. I will not really cover transcriptions or pathway, which are going to be covered by future modules later in the week. Um, again, about sort of genomic coordinates and, and file formats and th things to keep in mind. And I'll spend a bit of time on IGV, which is uh, one of the um, uh, genome viewers, and uh, UCSC. So this is um, a quote, uh, sorry, actually a, a, a book I recently read which is actually, if you're interested in cancer biology, is a very, very good book. Anybody read this book? Yes, one, two. It's a great book, I thought. Did you think it was a great book, too? Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's basically the history of, of, of cancer, and dating back uh, several uh, centuries. And so it's, it's quite interesting, um, all the, the things we do. And uh, it's got a uh, Pulitzer Prize, it's got uh, top 10 on all the New York Times and so on and so forth. So it's done really, really well. There's a quote in there from, actually quotes Bert Vogelstein about the revolution of cancer research is that can be summarized in a single sentence. Cancer is a, in essence a genetic disease. We've modified this, we've borrowed this quote many times, and John has and I have. It's like cancer is a disease of the genome. and I've modified it further by saying cancer is probably a disease of pathways. And so there's uh, obviously, you know, sort of focused on, on the kinds of things that interest you. But it sort of, um, it sort of points to the challenges uh, at, at looking at, at this data. And so what do we want to do here? We want to basically, why are we studying this? We're obviously interested in prevention, we're interested in, in diagnosis, and in treatment. Um, there's not much we can do uh, today. I'm not going to cover many things about uh, any of these topics, really. But um, the sort of looking at cancer genomes, it's definitely uh, not uh, going to help sort of the epidemiology or the health, healthy lifestyle type of analysis that we need to do. Uh, diagnosis, looking for markers of multiple types uh, that can be involved in various cancer types, is definitely and also help us find subtypes will be uh, require a very different treatment. And family history, physiology, assessment, histology, transcriptomic and genomic information. And that's the kind of things that we're going to be looking at. And so that sort of would fit in some diagnosis. And of course, in treatment and finding which uh, proteins and or uh, proteins in general usually are, are in pathways are um, have been modified or need to be modified to, to uh, provide a, a normal physiological processing. Um, Anahan and Weinberg uh, wrote a uh, classic review about 10 years ago, and they uh, wrote a second, a next generation of it, uh, and, uh, and just last year or this year, earlier this year, uh, in the Hallmarks of Cancer, um, and where they um, sort of quite very, very nicely uh, sort of summarize the sort of the expertise of the field and in the various types of treatments that are available and the various types of generalization that one can make about cancer. And I uh, definitely uh, invite you to, to have a look at, the, at this paper if you're interested in sort of an overview of, of this field. Can you put your laptops down? Oh, yeah. Please put your laptop down. And uh, I'm going to wait for the sound to. So, um, so some of the, these are some of the things that actually uh, John talked about earlier, but sort of setting it in the context that in the sort of 80s and 90s we had uh, human gene expression sequencing, ESTs, uh, mRNA, and so forth. Then we had the human genome mapping and sequencing. 
Then we had population analysis and polymorphisms, GWAS studies, and so forth in the uh, 90s and 2000s. Then there's this famous Homer paper that came out in PLOS Genetics where, uh, referring to some of the things that, uh, and I'll include it in the wiki, uh, which basically uh, said or demonstrated uh, that you could identify in a sort of a GWAS study when you have an affected and control group. If you had a few SNPs from an individual, you could sort of figure out statistically the probability of them belonging to one or the other. And so if you had, let's say, a study on bipolarism and you surveyed several thousand people and you had somebody's SNPs, a few, like 100 SNPs from an individual, you could say there's more likely that they belong from to the people that are affected by bipolar versus the control group. And that data used to be openly available to everybody, the GWAS study, and it just sort of clamped down. NIH just sort of went, I think, crazy on the other way by making all this data super hard to get. And not only was it under controlled access, but it was hard to get access to it. And now it's sort of, sort of adjusted a bit more but it's still, that, that kind of data is still under controlled access because it's deemed identifiable. So a, a GWAS and, of course, a genome sequence is deemed identifiable of an individual and therefore should uh, remain only accessible to scientists who demonstrate that they need to have access to that data to do the specific research that um, is entitled to be done by that kind of data for which it was consented for. So there's a, um, a whole sort of uh, uh, partition of, of controlled access and open, open data at that with uh, really sort of became quite big and, and sort of it's actually relatively recent, just a few years ago. The uh, Cancer Genome Atlas uh, pilot was initiated about uh, 2006, I think it was, or seven. And uh, just before the, uh, the ICGC that uh, John talked about, at the same time, there was also the 1,000 Genome Project. So after the One Genome Project, which was the first version of which came out in 2001, um, where we took, we sequenced one genome over 10 years um, at a great, a very high price, then that with the advent of next-gen sequencing, we were able to attack the 1,000 Genome Project, which is actually somewhere like two and a half thousand genomes. And um, it's uh, generated a lot of, of new data, actually, from the southern genome, which was open because it came from cell line uh, that were uh, uh, open and available to everybody. We talked about the International Cancer Genome Consortium, ICGC, what I would call a pilot. It was a slow startup, and now we're sort of getting into the full phase, and then the TCGA is, is, in, is also in full phase, and is now part of the ICGC. And I'll get back to that later. So, um, so the whole idea behind doing all this work, of course, is that we think that genomic variations lead to or are responsible for cancer. I mean, that's the, that's the hypothesis we're testing. We're saying changes in our genome is what causes cancer. And uh, that's uh, sort of something we have to keep in, in our mind. What happens, though, is that there's lots of changes in our genome which don't cause cancer. And so we have to sort of figure, figure what's, what's what. And there's all sorts of changes. There. We're talking about uh, somatic mutations, which are also referred to as single nucleotide variations, or SNVs, as opposed to SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are genetically inherited changes. So SNVs are somatically uh, acquired. Uh, small insertions and deletions, rearrangements, all of these things um, which lead to this other area of research we'll, we'll study this week, this copy number variation, or also copy number alterations, or CNAs. And there's lots of other sort of types of changes that are, that are happening. Uh, this is taken from a figure uh, from um, uh, a Nature paper from the UK group of Sanger, uh, Ellen Presence, at, uh, who's now at the, the, the GSC in uh, Vancouver, actually, where she was first, where she did her PhD, postdoc in the UK, and then 
did a few nature papers and then came back to Canada. Uh, uh, this is one on a uh, cell line um, where they've looked at all the mutations and classified all the different kinds of mutations. And you can see that most of them are actually not, if you look at the, the ones that affect coding sequences, most of them are, uh, don't affect missense. So this is missense is what would affect a, a coding sequence on a, on a uh, CDS, an encoding sequence on a gene. It's only a small percentage of those are responsible for that. And only a small percentage, uh, zero, um, of those are small insertions and deletions affecting coding sequence again. And the same for uh, rearrangements and, and so forth. And so it's, it's a really, uh, these events we're looking for are, are quite rare. They're quite rare if they're affecting coding sequence. Coding sequence uh, represents what percent of our genome? One, ten, hundred, point one. The, the what percentage of our genome encodes coding sequences? Two. Do I hear any other numbers? Three. Three. Zero point three. Zero point three. That's, so we're in a tenfold range so far. That's pretty good. Anybody else? John? One and a half. One and a half. So he's right in the middle. He's very <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> so people use one, one and a half as, as, a, as a number usually for, for that. So it's so one percent of a genome. And so when you're doing an exome, for example, we talked about exomes earlier today. You're sequencing about one percent of it. So you, so it's three gigs, and one percent would be how many base bases? One percent of three gigs. Thirty megs. Yeah, very good. Good quick math there. So, so that sort of gives you a, an idea. But this is what's the assumption there? What assumption are we making with all these statements? Not you, Michelle. But only the coding ones matter. We're making the assumption that cancer is caused by coding sequences. Or the mutations or the alterations in our genome that affect, that cause cancer are in the coding sequences. Is that a bad assumption? Yes. It is a bad assumption. It is a good assumption. <laughs> I mean, it's actually not a bad assumption. I mean, it's a it's it's one what we call we would call the low hanging fruit. I mean, most cases we know of actually are many cases that we do know of, but we don't know of all the cases, of course, are caused by uh, modified proteins, fusion proteins, uh, deletions missing proteins, overexpressed proteins, all of the of that and what sort of actually what line of evidence sort of sort of pointed us there in the first place before next gen sequencing. Cytogenetics. Cytogen well, cytogenetics pointed to sort of rearrangements. Some so in some cases, not always. But there are other sort of after cytogenetics before next gen sequencing sort of give you a 50 year period <laughs> or 100 year period to, to look at. Gene what? Gene transfer experiments. Gene transfer. That's yes, yeah. Those are old experiments. Good, good, good old experiments. Yeah, but there's a lot of gene expression experiments, right? So we've done, we've looked at gene expression profiles and tumor versus normal, and we see like gene expression is all over the place. It's very different in a tumor cell than it is in a normal cell. So we're sort of suspecting that there's something at the expression of the genes that's affecting cancer, that's associated with cancer, right? So there's lots of papers about signatures of gene expression that are associated with, with uh, different tumor types. And those are, is one hint that there's obviously a lot of things affecting proteins, but one could easily argue, and many have, that you can modify five prime and three prime sequences and modify gene expression, right? 
So this would be non-coding sequences that would be mutated and could affect gene expression. So that's something, obviously, the um, uh, epigenetic type analysis are doing it, looking at as well. So there's, that's, there's a whole arena there, too. So it's, it's not just the protein sequence. It probably is many of the times. And it's, like I said, the low-hanging fruit. So it's the easiest thing to look at. And we should definitely look at it. But we should also keep in mind that there might be some other, some other answers. And so, so where do I plant my flag? What do I spend, you know, uh, with all the rare events and large genome? So it's, you know, it's, it's actually three gigabases, but actually we have two copies of it. And so, and then with the heterogeneity that uh, uh, John talked about earlier today, it is actually six N chromosome, I mean, six gigs, two N chromosome, six gigs, six N, what am I talking about? Copy number variation. So two N chromosomes, six gigs, and but cellularity when we s sample a tumor could be 20, 30, 40 percent. But that varies, of course, from tumor type to tumor type, right? If you look at a CLL, it, it's pretty, it's pretty homogeneous. I mean, you can sort of enrich for your for your cells of interest quite uh, easily. Uh, for pancreatic cancer, it's quite difficult, and there's everything in between. So, so we've got all these nucleotides that are moving and changing, deletions, insertions, a lot of polymorph nu single nucleotide uh, uh, variations. And then we have, with the first human genome, we have this coordinate system. So we now know where most, not all, most nucleotides live. And the world is actually, as far as genome browsers are concerned, it's sort of trilingual, right? Not everybody speaks the same language. Not all icons mean the same things. But at the very least, and it took them a few releases to, to figure this out, but at the very least, these three guys, the EBI folks, the NCBI folks, and the UCSC folks, actually all use the same coordinate system. So nucleotide one of chromosome one is the same for all three places. All is basically agreed upon. What the differences are, though, between the three places and all everybody else, for that matter, is what do we decorate these nucleotides with? Which genes do we put on? Which transcripts do we put on? That will vary from one browser to another. So that's sort of a little challenging. There are some sort of clear sort of, I don't want to say winners, sort of leaders in the sense that they, everybody sort of uses certain types of, of genes and, and, and but as, as a subset. And the, actually, the folks at, it's hosted at NCBI, but it's actually a consortium of, of all the so, uh, EBI, UCSC, and uh, NCBI, and a, and a couple of other groups that agree not only on the, um, this coordinate system, but they actually also agree on a core set of proteins, of genes, coordinates. And what they did is they said, okay, you show me all your genes, I'll show you all my genes, we'll overlap the sets, and everything that we agree upon is going to be um, the core set that we all agree upon. So how many genes do we have? Another great question. Let's see how, how far are they. So there was a contest, right, before the human genome. So in 2000, 2000, it actually started in 99, 98. And so at Cold Spring Harbor, we would meet there every year, and we'd guess how many, how many genes are there in the genome. And, um, and the further away you were from the finished product, the cheaper the, the bet was. So at first, it was a dollar. So for a dollar, you could put down your number of how many genes you thought there were. So in like 96, 97, 98, that was a dollar. 98, 99, oh, that was $5. And 2000, it was $10. The year before the genome was finished, people were hearing rumors, and so the cat was out. But if you wanted to bet a number, it was going to be cost you 10 bucks. So the range of predictions, so I'll give you a ballpark figure, so you can tell me where it is, was between 
I think probably between like 24, 23,000 and 120,000. So what was the right number in the end? When the, in 2001, when the papers came out, the first paper. Sorry? 30? Yeah. Any other? Do I hear higher? Do I hear lower? 20,000. So actually, yeah. So the, I think the number, if I, John, was it, what was it when the papers came out? The two papers were 23, 24? Yeah, so it was about that. And the lowest one was about 25. And it was actually from uh, Phil Green. Uh, he's the one that won the, that bet. He had bet the lowest number. I mean, nobody, I mean, everybody was around 50, 60, or a lot of, uh, I had 30. So I was, but I was way, I, was, I had a lot of people, I got influenced by a colleague. <laughs> yes? How much did he win? Uh, probably about $100 or something like that. <laughs> Huh? No, he, I thought Phil. We got a from whose group? Oh, Lee Hood's group. Oh, anyway, I thought it was. I thought well, I heard a different story. I guess. This is why I have uh, John here to make sure my stories are straight. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> So what was your bet? I just bet people had to be closer to them. Oh. The back of the book, there's like 10 bets on me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but it, there's actually an added complexity. So, although we all have the same coordinate system, we now have different names for the same coordinate system. So over the years, you see from July 03, 04, 05, 06, it used to be called NCBI 34, 35, 36, and then it got renamed GRC, so which is this genome reference consortium, human 37. So it went from, and HG 16, 17, 18, and 19, that's the UCSC name. Okay? But UCSC and IGB and most browsers do not deal with this little modification here which is basically, we have GRC37, GRC H37, and we have patch release one, patch release two, patch release three, four, five, and patch release six is coming out in September. So what's a patch release? It's a change in a specific loci that doesn't affect the coordinate system. So your gene X, unless there's a patch that's totally on top of it, it won't move your gene. So the coordinates for your gene will not change. And so a patch level correction does not affect the position of any of the other genes. Okay, so that's a good thing. Because the big thing about any genome browser is you have to recompute everything and you can lift over one copy to the other copy and so forth and make copies of based on the coordinates uh, or based on the posi actual position of things that move and so forth. That's a, that's a bit of a headache. But you have to keep in mind and if you go to this page and you scroll down, you will see all the changes that were made for patch uh, 5 on 37. And there are, it affects thousands of nucleotides, if not more, and each of these patch levels. If it hits your gene, then, you know, you're, it's, it's changing amino acids, it's changing uh, the environment, you know, the transcription factor binding sites, and it's affecting all those things. Turns out that there's something like about 500 gaps still in the human genome, and so those are things where we don't know. We may know the distance, but we don't actually have no clue which nucleotides are there. And also there are um, uh, the other, um, oh yeah, so the other, in, Interestingly, like a lot of patches, for example, affect chromosome 6. So what's on chromosome 6? MHC. So MHC is impossible to sequence. It's, it's really a lot of repeats and so forth. So that one is a really tough one to get right. And so there's a lot of patch. They, they, they're working on it all the time. And there's some folks that are really interested in, in MHC and they want to get it right. And so they're working on it. But that's... 
uh, an example of a thing that gets patched up all the time, every release. Okay. So we talked about this, or John talked about this earlier. So you know, cancer data. So this is genomic information, but it's around clinical data about patients, about structured clinical uh, data about the treatment, about uh, the tumor. And uh, we are trying to, in the ICGC and uh, other projects, we're trying to capture that information and, and, and map that to a specific genome. And so that we have phenotype, genotype association. I mean, that's the, 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 the big goal here. And so what's the best way to represent all this? Well, we've been... Uh, all the genome browsers, most genome browsers, and there are exceptions, um, and we'll talk about some of those later in the week, but we're, we're really thinking about a linear scale. So we have a string of letters that are decorated with things, with annotations, right? And so what, what are annotations? Yeah. Supplementary information. Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah. What else? No information. Okay. It's actually a it's a it's a classic qualifying exam. I always ask students on a PhD qualifying exam what a annotation is in bioinformatics. It's actually let me uh, short circuit this one. It's actually. Uh, an interpretation. It's actually your interpretation of what that nucleotide, that gene, that it's 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 your opinion. You have supportive evidence, or you have weak evidence, or you have strong evidence. Uh, but it is an inter it's it's a it's an interpretation as to what this nucleotide, that gene, that region, that arm, uh, that protein, that pathway, and so forth are doing. It's it's our insight from the evidence we gathered and we want to decorate the gene because we want to the idea is that once we've discovered and figured out what it does we can tell the world and so we annotate genes and we annotate proteins so that it's done once and it doesn't have to be done over and over again but ideally we have evidence and then we will talk later probably uh, I think Gary will talk about evidence codes and things like that on, on pathways and, and, and gene ontology and so forth. And so all of that is, is our interpretation of what things are. So uh, for mutation data, for cancer data, there's a, this great database called uh, Cosmic Catalog of Somatic Mutations in Cancer. There are something like 5,000, 5,500 papers have been curated in Cosmic. And they've covered about four and a half million mutations, and they've covered about 19,000 genes. And we said there was about 20. So basically, in Cosmic, every gene is mutated. Are all genes responsible for cancer? Probably not. But of those 19,000, there's about 6,800 uh, that are have more than 100 mutations. So there's a lot of them that have very few mutations, but a lot of them have a lot of mutations. Or sorry, a small number have a lot of mutations. Uh, can I ask a question regarding more? Yeah. Um, are these actual mutations or are they variations? Is it something that they have checked with the So they're, they're, that's correct. So there are, there are, um, Sorry, there are single nucleotide variations. They're different than the control, which would be another tissue or from the same individual. So it's it makes them different. It's a polymorphism. It's a it's a variation. It makes them a variation. You're right. It's not a mutation. Although the the muta it's a mutation database, so they look at cancer cells and cell lines and tissues. And they try to find all, everything that's different from wild type. So it's, that way it's a mutation. It's different from wild type. It's not mutation from a Mendelian sense of the word, that it's not necessarily inherited, and it may not get passed on, and you may not have a phenotype. Does a mutation have a phenotype? Does a mutation without a phenotype a mutation? 
That's another qualifying exam question. <laughs> I would say no too, from a Mendelian point of view. That's a very Mendelian sort of uh, logic, right? That's how that's how he was able to see the peas had sort of the the yellow peas had a yellow mutation because he could see them, right? It's not because he could see the nucleotide change, but he could see a phenotype. So if we see a, a polymorphism and when we don't see any phenotype, the problem is that we see a phenotype and then we see a lot of changes. So we, there's a there's a disconnect there. And so actually, I think that's my next uh, not this slide but the next one. But I'll, I'll get back to, to that point. So uh, Stratton Campbell and uh, Fred Real had this uh, uh, review in Nature where they sort of explain what they thought. Uh, was happening, and basically they introduced the concept of passenger and, and uh, driver mutations. And so there's some driver mutations which actually are responsible for the cancer, and one of the consequences of the driver mutations is to cause other mutations, which are side effects, basically, of the tumor, of the cancer. And so... Um, so the driver mutations confer growth advantages to the cells carrying them and have uh, been positively selected for during evolution of the cancer. And uh, they reside by definition in the subset of genes known as cancer genes. Passenger mutations do not confer growth advantages, but happen to be present in the ancestor of the cancer cell when it acquired one of these drivers. And so they may get modified, but they're not causing the changes. So they're passengers. I think in a way this is oversimplifying things quite a lot. But it's a useful, again, it's a useful way to sort of separate the piles that we have to deal with. This first top pile is a very small pile, so we like small piles. This bottom pile is very big. We don't like big piles. So we'll get rid of the big pile. So that's good. So it's a really uh, a useful way of thinking about it. I have till when, 12.30? I'll just stop at 12.30 now. I'll go on after lunch. So uh, the data to be collected, so we talked about the clinical data, uh, tumor pathology, the age, gender, treatment, survival, and all of that kind of data is under controlled access, we talked about. So that basically, if you go to the ICGC website, there's three buttons at the top. There's the Cancer Genome Projects, there's Controlled Access, application form and there's a control and there's the DCC the, the data coordinating center so the the form that you have to go fill out asks you where you work asks you who your boss is who can fire you uh, if you don't do things right uh, does and he or she has to sign off that they will fire you if you don't do things right and you're saying that you will only use this data for uh, improving actually some uh, not ICG, either for the benefit of medical research or for even more restrictive for the benefit of cancer research. One we could argue that a lot of things are for cancer research, although they may not use the word cancer. So I like to use that. I have a very broad mind. I'm a very broad minded individual. So, other things which are, we talked about earlier today, is the germline data. So the SNPs, so the single type polymorphism, which are able to identify you. Like John said, they're your fingerprint. They're, you are able with, if I have your full SNP, I not only know you, but I could also identify your children. I could identify your ethnic background. I could identify a lot of things. How much cigarette you smoked, but that's, that's a separate issue. Um, so. So all of those, so those first two there, although gender is not, is actually in the first uh, bullet, gender is actually part of the open data. So actually we, we are letting, we're very generous. We're trying to let, so we can tell you if it's a male or female. So that's open. But everything else is, is controlled access. Germline data. So if we do, so what, what does that entail, germline data? It's like all the raw data. Right, uh, your your BAM files, all your your sequencing reads, that's all controlled access data. 
right? Because that entail that with that you can build a full genome, and you can get even if you're bad at it, you can get a lot of SNPs. Okay. So everything else, so somatic mutations. So mutations are not identifiable. Can I identify it that it's me versus? I can probably tell that somebody has cancer by looking at their mutations, but I can't say who, who that individual is. And I can probably figure out that who you are if I ask your neighbor, does your neighbor have cancer? The neighbor probably knows that you have cancer, but still, that's, that's not deemed identifiable. So somatic mutations are not identifiable. Mm -hmm. Copy number variations, currently not identifiable, could become. Maybe if there's enough work we do about copy number variation, maybe we'll be able to identify people by copy number variation. Currently, it's not uh, identifiable. RNA abundance and splicing, not the RNA reads. So a lot of things that we do to measure RNA requires the reads, the, the raw data from the RNA. So that's identifiable. So that's not available. But the summary of your RNA, so how many copies of each gene, how many transcripts for each gene do you have, that's not identified. So that's open. So that's I can download that, no problem. Problem is people aren't making it available. But if it was available, I'd be able to download it. Uh, RNA sequences I mentioned controlled access. DNA methylation, that also will be uh, open when people start uh, generating that data. That's still under, there's a lot of uh, technology sort of development that needs, that's needed there. This is actually an older slide than the one John showed, but it's the same idea. ICGC, lots of people working together and, and generating. It's, it's nothing that anybody can do on themselves. So 25,000 tumors, 25,000 controls, uh, 50 different tumor types, and so forth. It's a, it's, and we're about, right now, it's almost a bit more than 50% of the, of the projects have been committed. So people have said they, they can, they can uh, Generate. This slide I, John showed, I'm showing too, a very beautiful website. Um, and this is the, the page for Canada and Australia. So we are, so Australia and Canada for pancreatic cancer are working together on this project. And so that you have all the details and I think, uh, no, you can't, John's name has been cut off. But it's, it's on that page if you look at the bottom there. And um, he's there. So getting the data. So we talked about COSMIC. So COSMIC has mutations. So it only has mutations. So all of COSMIC is, is, is open. So it just tells you what the mutations are, which tumor types. Is a person, did the person die from this? Did, I think they have that. Uh, publication, which PubMed ID, um, what diagnostics on the tumor and so forth. But all sort of made open. ICGC homepage uh, has a link to the ICGC uh, data, which is a DCC. So data stands for um, Data Coordinating Center. So that's where all the data for the ICGC lives. TCGC home. Uh, yesterday I could not get to this page uh, because of the uh, um, hurricane. So all the computers were down on NIH campus yesterday. <laughs> And uh, but they're they're back up this morning, and the data somehow they managed. I don't know if they had the data somewhere else. The data was up, so that that was available. So um, for looking at data, so there's the UCG, uh, UCSC Cancer Genome Browser, which um, I was going to spend some time on today, but I've decided not to because of. Uh, it's basically a lot about uh, microarray and gene expression uh, um, um, visualization. So we're going to leave that till tomorrow. Um, the Cancer Genome Workbench is a, basically a derivative of the um, UCSC uh, workbench for cancer genomic data. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at the UCSC, and so we'll get back to that. And the Integrated Genome Viewer is, uh, is a, a tool from the Broad, which is uh, uh, the more I look at, the more overwhelmed I am. It's, it, it could, we could do a whole week on, on this tool, and we're going to do uh, half an hour. And, uh, but it's quite uh, overwhelming. And the thing about the uh, IGV was initially, um, 
started as a uh, gene expression microarray type viewer, and then it morphed into uh, next gen sequencing viewer, and then it morphed into pathway viewer integrator. It morphed into and it's doing all of that uh, always, and so it, it's it's quite uh, it's definitely uh, worth. Uh, the time to look at it, but we may not have all that time this week, but we'll, we'll have some. Um, this is uh, an updated version of the file the slide that John had, and that, see John, you have to put the new one with the right web page in the middle. <laughs> so the idea behind the um, ICGC DCC is that, which is hosted here on, uh, at OICR, is that uh, it is uh, using a Biomart engine, which allows uh, a federation of the various data centers. And ideally, the, the goal, the ultimate goal, because we're still in a, sort of in, in a young stage in this project, um, is to have every genome center that's generating data to host most of the data locally, and then through the magic of the internet, federate all the data across all the various centers. And, and we'll, we'll have a quick look at that later. Why do we do it that way? So the idea is that when you're looking at large data sets, and here we're talking about uh, the same way when the, the first data sets of the 1,000 Genome Project, which was like a few hundred genomes at the time, were being transferred between the EBI and the NCBI, because they like to have copies of each other's data, it basically plugged the transfer between uh, transatlantic internet. Basically, they occupied all the bandwidth between the two sites. And so we had to think about, we have to get more internet, more bandwidth, but we also have to think about how's the best way to share these large data sets. And there's left definitely lots of, of large data sets involved with the ICGC. Not only the sequence data, but there's images, There's and, and there will be uh, lots of other clinical and, and, and summary data, a lot of summary data and so forth. So one way is to, central, is to centralize everything. So centralizing is actually uh, easier in a way from an engineering point of view. You have everything in one place and you have, and so you can sort of figure out that it all fits in the box. Except then you have the problem about everybody sending their stuff and so that's one issue. And then the second way is to federate, is to have things federated so that everybody has copies of, of subsets, but then through um, a single user interface, you then um, share uh, everything. The thing is that you get the best performance on this way, but then you get the best flexibility. And the most, the most important flexibility with doing it, the federated model, is that when you add other nodes, to the model, then it doesn't get slower. It actually just continues doing uh, basically well. This first model, if you add more and more nodes, you may sort of, there's a single pipe going to this one place, it will actually slow things down. And so that's the, the sort of the, the, the way uh, Biomart and the system, which is the back end of the DCC, is operating. And it turns out that Biomart is actually used by a bunch of other databases. So it becomes even easier to integrate um, uh, G ICGC data with other data sets, Reactome, Ensemble, HapMap, and so forth. And there's uh, other, lots of other tools like Bioconductor and R and Galaxy, which also talk to Biomart so that it makes it easier to integrate with other tools as well. So if you go to the ICGC data portal, so at the dcc.icgc.org, um, you're faced with uh, basically a summary of the data that's currently available and um, the ability to do simple queries by just typing the G name and the, uh, and the search box there, or to actually look into sort of quick, flexible, or advanced type searches. And the sort of the more serious and courageous you become in going from uh, quick to uh, uh, flexible to advance, uh, the more options and, and parameters you're, you're allowed to, to, to use. That said, uh, as of um, a few months ago, and I think it hasn't changed much since, since July, um, 
there is actually very little data that has been submitted to ICGC or as part of the ICGC family. And the biggest, biggest subset of data is actually from TCGA. So initially, TCGA uh, was sort of an observer of the ICGC activity. And now they are full active members of the ICGC. So the ICG TCGA, which is the, the American uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, is currently overwhelming the ICGC. I mean, they have so much data and so much more of it than all of ICGC put together, so that to say TCGA and ICGC is basically saying the same thing. It's basically TCGA. But um, what we're talking about right now, this is actually the open access data. And we talked about controlled access data, like the reads, like the clinical information, and so forth. And that we still have to resolve. And so the reason we have to resolve that is that the ICGC and the TCGA, which are one but separate, are now using different <coughs> sort of authorities to validate who's allowed to look at the data. So we have two different sort of sets of lawyers, if you like, that think that they're right and that the other one's wrong, and saying, you, you know, we are deciding. It's no, no, we are deciding. And so it's sort of a little bit of an impasse right now that we have to resolve soon between if I'm allowed to look at one data set by one group of lawyers slash ethicist slash bioethicist, I should be allowed to look at, that should automatically give me access to the other set. It doesn't work that way right now, but so there might be some compromise and, and so, because all the ICGC data is actually being held at the European uh, archive that has got a sort of a model for access, and all the TCGA data is held in dbGaP, which is the American NIH archive held at NCBI, but policed by Building One at NIH. So right now, it's, it's not transparent. <coughs> we're in transition. It's, it, we're going to resolve it, but it's not perfect. So right now, you have to apply both places to have to look at complementary data sets. And so you should be able, although I'm not sure if you're allowed to do that, to actually mix your data once if you get approval on both sides and put it in one computer and, and do your own data analysis and so forth. The thing is ICGC and TCGA are doing large scale analysis of all the data sets as well. And so of course it'd be great if one place had everything. Right? But that's currently, so there's room for lots of discoveries here for you guys. After this workshop, you go home, apply for access to ICGC, apply for access to TCGA, put all the data on your hard disk, crunch it all up, and write papers. Except there's an embargo period, too. So that's another sort of, <laughs> another caveat. So the idea is that we want to liberate the data. We want to make the data free for everybody to use. And this is irrespective of controlled access or, or, open, or open access, open data. One caveat on the ICGC data, which is pretty much the same for everybody, is that all the data um, is freely available to all, even though Group X has not written a paper yet. Up until they write, they have submitted 100 genomes. So they were going to do 500, right? But once they have 100, and then from then on, you count one other year. So it's 100 plus a year, still no paper. You're not allowed to write. You're not allowed to write a paper about that 100 set. So the idea is that we'll make the data available, but the global analysis, we're going to leave it to the people that generated the data. So we're making the genomes available. So you want to go look for your gene, or you want to look at a small set of a few genomes to, to see, to validate something, you can do that. And you can reference that data and so forth, because it's on, it's on the site available for you to look at. But if you want to do an analysis of the whole 100 genome, oops, is that me? Oh, yeah, sorry, ignore. Uh, if you want to do a set of the whole uh, genome, uh, you have to wait one year. If, if I've put 100 genomes on the FTP site 
And I, a year later, I still haven't done my paper. I say, okay, you go and write the paper. Hopefully, I will have written the paper. Or John. John will have written the paper. You're writing the paper now, aren't you, John? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so we're, 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 we're not taking any chances. <laughs> and so the idea is that, so it's, all this is documented, not perfectly, but we're working on that too. So it's a, it's a new project, lots of new rules, lots of new things to, to, to take into account, and um, very important things to, to be aware of. Okay? So I have a question. Yeah. So there's a lot of, so the, like the TCGA ovarian paper is out. So once, oh, the other thing that can sort of short circuit the whole thing is if I write a paper. So if I write a paper right away, then the data is free for everybody to, to go do, right? And so you have to go look at each data set. Has the paper been published? How long has it been there? And so I said, so the math is a bit more complicated. I thought I'd make it simple, but I, I'm gonna add another complexity. So the first, the other clock, there's many clocks. So the one clock is I deposited data Let's say I deposit 10 genomes, or I deposit 100 genomes, and then a year later, if I haven't published, you can publish about my 100 genomes, even though I have 150. But some of them, 100 have been there, so you can talk about the first 100. So that's, it's almost like two years, almost, to, to write a paper. So I should have written a paper, but I haven't. The other clock that goes is that if I put in 10 genomes, and two years ago, I haven't run, done eight, I've only put in 10 for two years, not a good genome center. I'll get my hand slapped by, by the director of ICGC. But then after two years, if I haven't written a paper with those 10 papers or 99, paper, uh, 99 genomes, then that, they're free game too. So there's actually a paper about this, about data release, <laughs> and, and, and the explanation of, of this whole sort of uh, uh, embargo period and why, so it's, it's important to, to free the data, but it's also important to respect the scientists that generate that data to give them the opportunity to write the whole paper. Okay, any other questions? Yes. There was a recent, uh, some kind of landmark decision with the GPATs in states. Yes. Uh, were there any problems here because of that? Not that I heard, but, uh, uh, so what was the GPAT about? Yeah. And, uh, so it did affect, I think it, it's international, I think. Well, it's US based. But it's a US based, but I think it affected. So some people are choosing to ignore it. I don't know. Actually, I'm not a lawyer, so I better not answer that. Yes? Uh, what does numbers mean? It means, for example, so this is number of data sets. So it would be like, let's say, um, pancreatic cancer OICR, that's us at that point. There was, it's actually an old slide, if you think of it. So there was one um, sample that had structural rearrangement and uh, one for a uh, single mutation. There's more than that now. This is an old slide. Is it genome wide? Yes, it would be full genome. So some of the um, gene expression here, these are not necessarily RNA seq it could be uh, pathometric. So the whole genome analysis of gene expression. Okay, so it's uh, 12.33, so we're gonna break for one hour.